Welcome, everyone, to a very well-subscribed um, event today. Um, I'm, I promise to be completely incoherent, having just travelled half around the world with Jane Mann, a colleague from CUP, to talk about textbooks in, in Bangkok. But it's nothing compared with the travelling that Lucy has done. So I stand in awe of her ability to have travelled the globe. Um, actually, sitting next to Simon Liebus, you've probably got more air miles between you than <laughs> any two people I know. Um, some very practical things just to start off with. So um, please switch your phones to silent, but don't turn them off. Bearing in mind my son has just moved my phone to the nuclear alert sign. I'll make sure that mine is off. Um, get involved with... The, the reason for not switching them off is do get involved with the con conversation online. That's the hashtag, so hashcam ed live, using that one. And we are being filmed. Uh, it, this is quite important because we found that, that a number of the lectures have been filmed and then accessed an awful lot by a very large number of people. Um, we, we choose the lectures very carefully. Often they articulate with some very pressing issues, like, like Helena Badsey's work in on, on working memory. And um, that topicality or saliency uh, is followed through into filming it and then making it very widely available globally. So the video will be available on the Cambridge Assessment website next week. We do have a photographer clicking away. Yes, click, click. Um, and if you'd prefer that we don't use your photograph, I mean, I'm pretty bad from any angle, um, in the external publicity, please let one of the network team know. So Rosie or Carrie at the back. Um, uh, just let them know after the seminar. Um, we're also involved in something quite interesting, which is A101. Now, now, this that sounds like Room 101. It's not. It comes from D101, which was um, the Open University Introduction to Social Science, uh, which was a really interesting introductory compendium to all the key concepts in social science for Open University students. And the Open University really scratched its head after the first year because they had 2,500 students and they'd sold over 100,000 copies. Um, and it turns out it was such a good introduction that it was used by undergraduates right the way through England and then through the world. We want to try and do the same with A101, which is an introduction to the principles of assessment. We, 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 we don't want to you know, monetize desperately what we do. What we want to do is to really get understanding of assessment out there, particularly amongst teachers. And our, our concern to do that has been vindicated by the trialling. We wanted to trial it with just a few hundred people, and we've had just thousands of people interested in, in trialling it. So that, that will be coming and a launch next year, and the, and the leaflets for that are downstairs. <coughs> Another plug is that, oh, in that bag are, are some copies of Cleverlands. Um, for those of you who actually continue to read paper rather than um, tire your minds and fail to actually comprehend things on screen, here, here is a real thing, a book. Um, There's an e-book as well, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> read, read the real one, it's just so much nicer. Um, and oh, it's a special edition, isn't it? The ones in the yeah, with a, with um, a rather nice uh, inside cover. Now that's that's it for the practicalities. Other than the fire exits, if there is there is no um, fire practice planned. So if, if if the fire alarm does go off, which is a continuous sound, then the exits are there and there, and we gather on the, the recently tended lawns outside. Uh, well, that's the A101, Introducing the Principles of Assessment leaflet available downstairs. Right, so, Lucy. Um, yeah, I mean, you've travelled the globe, um, but, but I just thought, hmm, the book was launched earlier in the year, and, and publishers do very little now, actually, if, you, if, if you've, any of you have been involved in writing a text. They love you writing them and do nothing to promote them. And the authors wind up doing all of the promotion. It's exhausting. So we have many colleagues who have done this. Uh, it's not good, actually, because it means that knowledge is not disseminated in quite the way that Gutenberg intended. Um, you know, books are a fantastic medium for, for knowledge being transmitted around the world. Um, and, yes, looking sternly at you, Elizabeth, the, the publishers need to do more um, <laughs> in promoting the things that they've commissioned. Now... So I thought, earlier in the year, there was a, a very, very good launch at Policy Exchange, a lot of interest. But, hmm, let's have something in November. Let's do it again. 
because this is impressive, this work, and it's impressive for a very specific reason. It's like an educational odyssey, somebody relatively young, compared with some of us in the room, Lucy, who, who, who became frustrated and therefore interested in education um, and capitalised on links or, or hassled people in schools around the world to allow her to teach and gain some experience. But that was turned not into an odyssey with just sirens on rocks. It was turned into something scientific. Um, it is, I think, prima, a prima facie exercise in compelling social science. So, of course, we have observation bias. When we go around the world, we, we look for certain things. We don't look for certain things, so we don't notice them. Uh, sometimes we notice things that we haven't looked for. But what Lucy did was to go and experience and immerse herself in educational realities in different contexts, and then with intellectual curiosity access additional theory to the theory that she took to those experiences to seek to explain the things that she had experienced. And in my mind it makes it an, an extraordinary journey of, of, of an illuminating kind informed by some of the best research into educational practice. But because it was driven by the phenomena you know, she experienced it and sought to explain it. It is very wide-ranging in its considerations. Of course, it's full of judgment. Um, but it is very wide-ranging in the way in which it brings theory to bear to explain what was actually happening in the contexts. And from that, I think, comes some very interesting insights. Um, I mean, Lucy and I spent many hours discussing the book. I, I wanted her to leave a far more personal experience into it, but it would have been twice the size, I think, had you... Had you done that? As it is, it contains some lovely anecdotes which take you into the lived experience of teaching in these particular classrooms, in these, in these schools, in these systems, with all of the things impinging on it, ideas of ability, the culture of, of the locality, the culture of youth society, the parental expectations. It brings all of those to bear. But it doesn't simply provide us with descriptions informed by theory. I think within it, there are some startling insights. I'm not going to go through them, because you will hear some of them tonight. But for me, the standout one, which I've, I've stolen relentlessly, usually attributed, is about culture. Because so many comparativists say, hmm, it's jolly interesting going to another nation and observing it, but you can't draw anything from it because it is culturally so specific. It's interesting, but not generalizable. But you'll find in Cleverlands something which is, I think, profoundly insightful in terms of culture. Because Lucy says, hell, a school is an institution. The whole point is, it's an institution with particular rules. It is a place where there is a culture. That culture can be changed by the actions of the actors within that institution. The managers, the leaders, the teachers, uh, the, the technical staff supporting the teaching, the students themselves the alumni, and so on. Now, in other words, culture is not something that we just take for granted and which can roll on relentlessly by itself. It's something that we can manage within the school. And that includes things like ideas about ability. So I think from this, we not only get an insight into other systems informed by theory, but we also get through, I think, very good social science, some startling insights which can inform extremely progressive new policy in our and, and, and other settings around the world. So without any further rambling from me and a kind of a haze of jet lag, uh, Lucy, over to you. I won't say much about you other than to say that you did this. You were then, oh, I think, probably provided with more job offers than I've seen many people being given, most of which you refuse because you want to remain relatively independent and, and free-flowing through the system. So, Lucy, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Tim. It's, it's quite, a, quite a beginning, quite a lot to live up to. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much, all of you, for, for coming um, to see what I have to say today. Um, so I'm going to launch, launch right in um, with why I'm here in the first place. Um, and that is that I started as a teacher. Um, I taught science and psychology A-level in a school in southwest London um, in a fairly challenging area. And by year three, I'd become a little bit disillusioned with aspects of the English education system. 
of course it was challenging. Teaching is challenging even if you're an experienced teacher and I'd only been there for three years. But it wasn't only challenging because of the students who brought their own challenges, many of them from, from home. But it was challenging because certain things that were being put into place by the school leader, um, be, in turn because of the kind of things that she was hearing from, from the policy, from what she perceived Ofsted wanted, I didn't think were necessarily the best for the children in our care. So that got me interested in education systems um, and education policies. Um, and I went to study just down the road, in fact, came to do um, a master's in education here. Um, and I read a lot about top performing education systems, um, top performing as defined by PISA. And politicians at the time, so at the time we had Michael Gove talking a lot about PISA and that this is the reason that we are going to strengthen the league tables is because this is what the top performing schools are doing. Um, so I, I focused on accountability in my master's and read a, a bit more about what different countries are doing. But despite having read, read a fair bit about them, I didn't really feel I could fully understand what was going on in that country. Because, of course, what a, single, a single policy, if you look through a single lens, such as accountability um, or assessment or even pedagogy, which is, obviously has a huge impact on children, you can't really get a, a good idea of, of what the whole picture looks like unless you also look at how it sits with other policies in a particular context. So I decided that um, age 26, I think I was, I had nothing to lose. Um, I just finished my master's. I, I didn't have a mortgage. I didn't have children, didn't have any romantic interests at the time. I thought, you know what, I'm completely free. I had some savings um, from, um, from living with my parents while I was teaching. And I thought, I'm going to go and have a look at these different countries. I'm going to volunteer to teach in their schools. Um, and if, if that fails, because, you know, they may well say no chance, um, I'm going to sit in coffee shops with a big sign. Uh, this is me with a sign on my back. Uh, the sign says, hello, I'm Lucy. I'm a teacher from England. I'd like to hear about education in your country. Please come and talk to me. <laughs> uh, and that is me in Finland talking to a Finnish parent. Um, so I literally walked around with the sign stuck to my back. Um, but I, I also, you know, sat in coffee shops in all the countries I went to, um, except China, because I wasn't on the right visa. And there were policemen everywhere. Um, but I decided that, that was, that was a, a strategy. <clears throat> but more than that, um, I was very lucky in that educators are very generous. Um, and I'd reached out through a variety of means, through e emails, um, friends of friends of aunties of friends, couch surfing, I don't know if any of you have heard of that, whole, a whole host of different ways of trying to get in touch with teachers in different countries um, and ask them, can I come and help out at your school? Oh, and can I come and stay with you as well, please? <laughs> I didn't have that much money. Um, and remarkably, they said yes. So I did. Um, I went and, and taught in a number of schools. Um, and, and so one option that was open to me at the time is I could have contacted um, local governments or governments or policy institutions and said, I'm interested, please, can you put me in touch with some schools? The reason I didn't do that is because I, I wasn't looking to go, at the time, to the best schools in the world. I didn't want to see, you know, Singapore's finest school. I wanted to see Singapore in, in general, in as much as it, there's such a thing exists. I wanted to go to a few schools in each country to get a spread of what a normal school is like. And again, there is no such thing as a normal school, of course. But I, I, I suppose I mean not a school that was um, notable for a particular reason. Um, so that's why I took this approach, going via teachers. Um, it didn't always go that smoothly. So in one case, um, the school that I'd intended to visit in Shanghai had fallen through. So I'd already been to visit a, um, an experimental school in quite a wealthy area that was doing some interesting things. I'd been to visit a, um, a school for migrant children, so migrants to Shanghai, so the, um, children of migrant workers, typically quite poor. Um, and I, I visited, then I taught there for a week. But I really wanted to go to a school in the suburbs, a kind of, you know, typical school near where I was staying, near the teacher I was staying with. So I thought, well, I can, I can just ask. There's no harm. This is clearly becoming my philosophy. There's no harm in asking. Uh, so I walked up to the school. I do not speak Mandarin, but I had 10 lessons before I went to China. Uh, I walked up to the school, and Chinese schools have guards outside them. Um, you can see one in the in the picture here. And I, I said, which I think means probably poor grammar, but I'm English, I'm a teacher. Um, and I also said something which means I look school. 
and I can't remember how to say that now in Mandarin. But so I said that, and the, this guard just stared at me incomprehensibly. Um, and I just stood there and smiled at him um, until he picked up the phone and said, what I can only imagine is something like, there's a strange English woman standing outside the school. Please send someone down who speaks English. And they did. So a lady came down who spoke English, and, and I said, I'm, I'm really interested in what you're doing. Shanghai does so well in international tests. I'd love to come in and, and um, visit some lessons or speak to your teachers. And she said, yep, yeah, fine, give me your email address. I'll come back. Um, you can come back tomorrow. So it worked amazingly. Um, these are some of the lovely teachers that I stayed with. So through staying with teachers, just got a perspective um, from, from then day-to-day -day chats in the car, um, as well as more formal interviews, which were recorded as well. Uh, interviewed young and old. So this is my youngest interviewee. Um, he was telling me about the effects of Confucian culture on setting and streaming in Japanese and <laughs> Chinese schools. So that is what I did. And as, as Tim said, I didn't just then think, right, I'm going to write a book about what I saw. Um, I went and read what everyone else, not everyone else, What's lo lots of other people, so really standing on the shoulders of giants in terms of trying to understand um, the evidence behind various different policies and practices uh, on a global level. So what I hope um, you'll see today, because I'm going to try and do this in this talk, and uh, what I have done in my book is illustrate concepts or ideas um, or theories with my own experiences and anecdotes and conversations with people, but back that up with a wider body of research evidence so it's not just, I saw this, therefore... This is how it is. So to, let's to start with what is PISA, because ultimately I went to these countries because they performed well in PISA, and those countries being Finland, two provinces in Canada, Shanghai, which I know is not a country, but until recently entered um, separately from the rest of China, um, Japan and Singapore. Um, and this, this slide I included before I saw the list of who was coming this evening, and I realize you're all assessment experts. So of course, you'll know this already, and that's uh, slightly intimidating. So here we go. So it's the Programme for International Student Assessment. Um, it was designed in the 1990s by the OECD to measure students' performance at the end of compulsory schooling, so typically ages 15 to 16. And it tests the application of skills in reading, maths, and science. Um, and I've highlighted application because what a lot of people who aren't familiar with PISA think um, is that you can just cram and then score highly. And that's why all these East Asian countries are doing well, is because they just swallow the textbook, wrote learn it all, and we don't have anything to learn from them because that's not what we want for our students. Um, you cannot do well in PISA through just learning facts alone. Um, it does require an application of, of that knowledge. So here's an example. Um, example of a maths question, one of the PISA tests. I'll just give you a minute to, to have a look at that, see the kind of question it is. So you can see that in order to answer that question, I need to figure out what mathematical operations are required initially, conduct those mathematical operations, and then figure out what my answer refers to back in that re real-world context. Of course, it's a, it's a pen and paper test or a computer-based test. It's not actually real-world. But it gets at some, of, at some of what it is to use mathematics. Of course, I also acknowledge that there is more to education than PISA. Um, that's another response sometimes I get. Well, we don't care about PISA because we want children to learn 21st century skills, and that's all going to be obsolete because we can just Google everything. Which I'm not going to go into that whole argument very much today. I assume that the audience here are with me on the fact that we can't just Google everything. Um, but I will say that even if you think that um, there is more to education than the application of reading, math, and science, which, of course, I do, and I'm sure you all do, most people would also agree that this is at least an important part of what we want children to be able to do. We want all of them to be able to leave school with at least basic knowledge of mathematics and literacy to enable them to participate in 21st century life or, in, or would have been the same in 20th, 20th century, 19th century, etc. Right, so I'm going to go through quite a variety of topics today. Um, so I'm not going to deep dive into anything. I'm going to give quite a, a big overview and hopefully tie some of those things together to give you an idea of, of what's going on in these countries. I want to start by addressing some stereotypes around pedagogy. Um, 
So many people think, um, and this is partly, I think, based on media representations, that in Singapore, Japan, Shanghai, the style of pedagogy is the teacher stands at the front, writes on the board, gets children to memorise what's on the board and copy it down in their books. Um, equally, based on media stereotypes, you might think that in Finland, the teacher never does any talking at the front of the class. Um, all the children are in groups, working on their own projects for weeks at a time. Oh, and there are no subjects. Um, that's not true. None of that is true. And I do think the media should take a little bit more responsibility for accurately reporting what's going on um, in these countries. I want to give you a quote just to illustrate this um, on, let's start with Finland, from a girl called Emma. So when I met her, Emma was... 16? No, 15. Um, and she was telling me, I said, well, just try and describe for me a typical lesson. You know, what, what happens in, in Finnish school? You walk into the classroom, what usually happens? She says, we'd come into class and be seated and go through the homework. If you hadn't done it, there'd be such anxiety because they'd call out random people for the answers. And if they picked you, you wouldn't know. Then they'd see if anyone had anything to say about it or anything to ask. Then we go through the next subject we were going to talk about. Like, this is how it works, and that's how it goes. And we'd make notes and ask questions and discuss. And then they'd give us some exercises to do from our workbooks, and that would be the rest of the lesson. The teacher would go to individual people if they had questions. But it depends on the subject. It was like that in math, but in languages, we'd have sets of work, like oral pair work and games. So you can see that from that description that it's certainly not the case that children are just doing extended student-centered type um, learning. And actually, st so stats um, backing that up come from TALIS, so a big survey of, of teachers. Um, and they were asked ver various different questions about how often they do certain practices. Um, and one of those questions was um, asking them how often they report that children work in small groups to come up with a solution to a problem. Um, and in Finland, 37% of teachers said that they do that every lesson or most lessons. In the UK, 58%. So it, English teachers are doing that m much more than, than Finnish teachers are. Um, and I should also mention at, at this stage that a lot of what Finland is doing now sounds very interesting, but cannot logically be the cause of their high results in PISA. Um, Finland first came um, top in the world in PISA in the year 2000. So the really interesting stuff we should be looking at, therefore, is what they were doing in the 1990s um, and the 1980s. And there is an excellent paper on this by Mr Oates himself, um, and a man called Gabriel Salgren, which you should have a look at, called Real Finnish Lessons, which is um, very interesting on, on that. Um, and then, so this, the East Asian stereotype um, was also a challenge for me. So these are stereotypes that I held myself. Um, and so, and to, be, to be completely honest, sometimes it was true. So in, in Japanese high schools, there was a, quite a lot of teacher talk. Not to the extent that it was a whole lesson, but there might be 20 minutes of the teacher explaining something, first of all, at the beginning of the lesson. But I also saw so much in really interactive, really active thinking going on in East Asian classrooms, more so, in fact, than anywhere else, um, in Singapore in particular. So give, to give you an example of, of one lesson, um, uh, in, a, in a maths lesson, so the teacher would ask a fairly straightforward question and take answers from three different students, write their answers on the board, not saying if they were right or wrong, then say, OK, so... That's, that you come up with this answer. Tell me your strategy. How did you get there? OK, that's interesting. What's another way? What do you think of that answer? How could, how could we do it a different way? So really getting students to think about the strategies that they were using to achieve different, different answers, not simply saying, well, that's right, that's wrong, and memorize this, please. Now, I'd like to share a pedagogical snapshot with you. Um, this, this is very interesting data, but it is quite limited, hence the snapshot. So this graph, I'm not sure how much you can see from where you are, but this graph um, is a mapping of student report um, of the kind of pedag pedagogical practices going on in their classrooms across all of the different countries that take part in PISA. Um, and the way that the, the question has worked is, is um, a number of questions the OECD have defined as being more traditional um, and teacher-directed instruction, and a number of questions they've defined as being more student-oriented instruction. So the, the kind of things you might expect, um, teacher-directed, the teacher will um, set out at the beginning of the lesson what they, we, they want us to learn, and the teacher will explain concepts, and um, student instruction is we will we, um, work in groups to, to find out um, 
the answer to a question. For example, if you're interested in the full breakdown of these, it's um, the, the study is by um, Alfonso and colleagues, 2016, um, OECD published. Um, so it's really interesting, the mapping here. So on the right, you'll see more um, teacher-directed instruction, so-called. On the left, more student-oriented instruction. Um, and I'll talk about the y-axis in a moment. But what, what they've done here, sorry, what I've done here, is highlighted countries that do very well in PISA. Um, and you will see, sorry, I haven't got a, a pointer with me, but the OECD average is just above the three on the, on the x-axis. So you can see that with the exception of Switzerland, every top performing country is further to the right, which means they are using more teacher-directed instruction than the OECD average. Yes, please. Just in case. Thanks. Oh, well, clever. Snazzy. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Tim. Oops. Um, so yes, in case you didn't see that OECD average is there, and you can see these yellow countries mainly being more, more teacher-directed instruction. Um, in terms of what that looks like, because obviously that covers a whole host of different practices, um, teachers did, I mean, and this more, there was more in common between the different countries than there was um, different, although obviously they were not the same. Um, you, it was quite a lot of whole class teaching, so teachers would have a clear idea of what they wanted students to learn, um, would often start by either going over the homework or explaining a new concept to the children. They would then engage them th throughout that explanation often in, with questions, um, encourage class discussion, do the kind of thing I was just talking about in Singapore, getting students to comment on each other's answers, um, and then do some kind of, of practice or activity using what they've just learnt um, and check for understanding. Um, so that's... Yes, and then so it's just um, something else. Um, the OECD have also had a look at this kind of thing using um, teacher report rather than student report, and they found that students were less likely to succeed in both easy and difficult mathematics items if the teachers in their school re reported more frequent use of student-oriented strategies. So it seems like student-oriented strategies are not particularly helpful when it comes to having knowledge and applying it um, it, they may well be helpful for other things, but not so much for, for this. Um, and then memorization and elaboration. So you know what memorization is. Um, elaboration, um, the kind of items um, that counted towards this were um, my teacher um, helps me make connections to other subjects um, and, and think, thinking deeply um, about particular um, concepts. Now, that this is much more balanced. You'll see they're all kind of sped around the middle, um, both, both things being important. Have a look at who's up here. So, you know, we, we say, oh, we can't learn anything from Japan because they just memorize everything. We, in the United Kingdom, our students are reporting that they do much more memorizing than any country apart from Ireland, including all these Asian countries. So that's a surprise. Um, now, this is, I've called this a snapshot because this, this is, of course, when students have sat PISA, so when they're 15 to 16. So at age 15 to 16, these are the kind of strategies that students are using. English students, you, students from the UK, sorry, are memorizing more than, um, than even Chinese students, for example. But that's just when they're 15. If you have a look at what they're doing when they're seven, eight, and nine, it's actually quite a different picture. So um, in the early, early year years, I'm not talking about early years being three, four, four, and five, but ages seven, eight, and nine, Chinese students are doing a lot of memorization. They are learning all of their times tables, they're learning all of their number facts, they're learning the Chinese characters. Um, there's a lot of that, and they, there's a lot of practice. There's a lot of what you might call drill, in that they're really practicing the basics, really getting to grips with those. But but what it seems that this means is that when they're older, they're actually doing more kind of elaboration, let's connect ideas, rather than relying on memorizing the different steps to solve a particular problem. And I'm going to int introduce you to a couple of people. Let me just get the right part. Oh, I don't, I don't know how to scroll down. No, I'll just find it in here. It's fine. Um, let's meet Sophie. Sophie and Roni. Okay, so when I was in Canada, I met two Chinese students who'd moved there a couple of years ago. 
Um, Sophie had actually moved there when she um, was 15, so she went to school in Canada, but had been exper had experience learning in, in China. Um, Roni had moved as an uh, undergraduate and was now teaching um, students mathematics, preparing them for um, applications to college. Um, so he had some very interesting theories about the differences between um, Chinese and Canadian students in terms of the kind of questions they had and the kind of skill level they were at on, the, these, on these maths papers. Um, and there's a particular question in the, the entrance exams for American college, as they call it, um, which give you lots of facts about um, a number. They don't, they don't tell you what the number is. They say um, x is a prime number. Um, I can't think of another thing now apart from x is a divisible by, which obviously couldn't make sense, so I won't use that one. But they'll give you a number of fa facts, and then they'll say, what is the number? And Roni was saying that he has a, a mnemonic, a way of, of approaching this, um, which Canadian students really like, but Chinese students don't, called Zone F, which is you can just talk, think, think through the various different kinds of number. So is it zero? Um, is it a negative number, et cetera? Um, and I want to tell you why he thinks that this is the case, that Canadian students like that and Chinese students don't. For the Asian teacher, before they help students onto that level, so that kind of more elaboration, they actually use a more systematic approach. You know, a massive amount is drills, exercises, and homework to make students master things, to feel the intuitive side of it. But this comes from a massive amount of homework and practice. Whereas the typical Canadian student has so much less experience practicing with numbers that they're still on the stage of following the structure. And partly because they didn't have enough of the structure at school, they still appreciate how their tutor has the secret weapon of zone F so that they can solve the puzzle. So they're still on that stage. And then Sophie, um, Sophie was um, in the same conversation. Um, oh, why is Sophie gone? Yes, this is a, um, and she was complaining that when she came to Canada, she had to follow all the structured steps to come to an answer in her, mathematical les her mathematics lessons, even though she could just see the answer and do it in one step. She had to go through all the steps anyway. So she said, they just require you to do it the way they taught you. They give you an, exa an example assessment question in class with some numbers plugged in, and then you have to use your calculator to find the answer. In the exam, it would be exactly the same question, except the numbers are changed. So as long as you memorize the right way to do it and plug in the numbers, you get it right. So here you have the Chinese accusing the Canadians of being dogmatic, <laughs> okay? Different from usual. Um, and I do think this helps explain as well why the United Kingdom is way up there in that our 15-year-olds, because they haven't had enough practice of the basics and actually memorized those number facts and really got the intuitive side of maths, it means they're still having to memorize the steps rather than having a fluency of mathematical understanding. Right, I, I thought I ought to talk to you about assessment today. Um, so just, just a, I suppose, a, a, few, a few thoughts um, on things that, that these different systems are doing um, in terms of assessment. So, so Shanghai, so for a start, I think formative assessment is easier for Chinese teachers because Chinese teachers teach fewer, or at least teachers in Shanghai, teach fewer lessons per week than English teachers do. So typically they might teach three lessons a day. What that means is they have time in the day to mark the student work from that day so that the very next lesson they're able to present to the students, here are some things that you all didn't, didn't get right, let's go over some misconceptions. And in one, there was one um, lesson in a Chinese school where I asked the teacher if I could visit her classroom. She said, oh, well, it won't be very interesting. We're just, we're just going over the homework. And I thought, what you don't think is very interesting is probably the reason that your children understand whatever subject it was. Um, because you are identifying the misconceptions that children have in, in, in the homework and, and addressing those immediately. Um, they're also, in, within a, a lesson, asking a lot of questions, um, like 50 to 120 questions a lesson, starting with some easy questions, getting harder, of the kind that I was um, explaining to you earlier. Um, in Singapore, many of the teacher's guides contain hinge questions. So, so I suppose... My point here is that you don't have to be an expert teacher already to use some really excellent questions and lessons because it's provided for you. So not all schools have these, but some schools have teacher's guides where it will include a question which is really going to help you as a teacher understand where the students are, whether they've understood something or not, um, and then direct the, the lesson content appropriately. 
Um, in Japan, similarly, they, they plan these through lesson study, and I'll talk a little bit more about lesson study later, but groups of teachers planning together. So it's not that before every lesson I need to really think through and come up with some amazing questions which are going to help me formatively assess the students. They are given to me, um, often by more experienced teachers. So um, Stevenson and, and Stigler, um, some researchers who did some um, research in Japan a couple of decades back now, but they asked one teacher what they did in lesson study because like, what do you talk about? And the teacher said, a great deal of time is spent talking about questions we can pose to the class. Which wordings work best to get students involved in thinking and discussing the material? One good question can keep a whole class going for a long time. A bad one produces little more than a simple answer. So again, you know, your stereotypes about Japan where it's right, wrong answers, memorize this, not actually correct. Um, in Finland, students are encouraged, encouraged to mark their own work. They put quite a, a lot of um, focus on self-assessment because they want the students to, to form a realistic image of their own development and understand what the teacher's looking for. Um, and in Canada, even the tests that they have at, at the province, so these are stand standardized tests, are used in a formative way. Um, so let me introduce you to some teachers from Canada. So um, these teachers are from Ontario, and they're talking about the EQAO, which is their standardized tests in primary school. It's more of a dipstick. I don't think anyone feels threatened by it anymore. Anymore. If you had grade three when the EQ, EQAO came in, you died. But people know what it is. It took a while to get to this point, but people realize now that it's not something that reflects your practice. Um, School principals don't hold individual teachers to account for their class results, as it's not one person's responsibility, right? The grade six results are the responsibility of teachers in grades four, five, and six. So that's us as a collective, not each person as an individual teacher. Standardized testing is not our driver, but it is our driver in a way. We didn't do well in grade six this past year, and we wanted to know why. So we looked to see where the gaps were, for example, in fractions. What do we need to do as teachers to reduce those gaps? So they're taking even, even a kind of standardized um, test, and they are using it to see, right, where did our students have misconceptions? What should we be doing? And actually, what also happens in Canada is superintendents will get involved in those kind of conversations and say, OK, so your students didn't do so well in this. This school um, in the district, they've got a really great way of addressing that. Why don't you go and have a look? And they will link schools up with one another to learn from one another. Um, moving on to summative assessment proper. Well, that was summative assessment, but used formatively. Um, it, this is probably the thing which differed the most between all of the countries I looked at. Um, so to give you an example, in Finland, there, there is regular testing. So a lot of people, again, misconceptions think that in Finland they just don't test students. That's not true. The teachers give students fairly regular tests. What they don't have is, is a national universal examination. So there is no exam set by the state that every student takes. Um, there is a, an examination at 18 that those who are still in school at 18 take. But at 15, to get into a selective college, um, it's actually a teacher-given grade. So the teachers will assess students continuously over the last two years of, of middle school um, and give a grade based on, based on that. Um, in, so China... There are very high stakes tests, um, and this was actually quite sad to see in terms of how this affected students. Um, even so, so, one of the teachers I stayed with had a 15 year old daughter, and she would regularly do three or four hours of homework a night, and that was just the norm. And the parents don't like it, or well, some of them encourage it, but, but a lot of them said to me, well, we, we haven't really got a choice, because everyone else is doing this, so if our students didn't, they'd fall behind. Um, and the nature of those high stakes, um, I think it par partly comes from the system and it partly comes from the culture. So, so they're high stakes in the sense that at 15, it's to get into a selective high school, and at 18, it's to get into a selective university. So there is competition there. Not everyone can get into the most prestigious universities. Um, but I think the, it's particularly high stakes in, in Shanghai because I think culturally, and I hope no one minds me making these generalizations, um, there is a very strong idea about what success is, and it's quite a narrow view. Um, to be successful, you need to go to the best high school, go to the best university, do the most difficult course to get into, and that will line you up with a job in one of the best companies, 
um, and even get you the best spouse. Um, I was, went for a walk in the park in Shanghai um, and came across a whole load of middle-aged people, not students, with paper with Chinese written on. As I said, I do not speak Chinese. I could not read Chinese apart from numbers. So I noticed some numbers and figured out later that it was a marriage market. So parents had come to basically advertise their children as prospective marriage partners to do arranged meetings. Um, and some of the information on there was education, where you went to university, what course you did. So literally, you know, that's the stakes for the student. I'm thinking, gosh, if I don't manage to get into university, I might not find a nice lady or a nice man. So there's that, that level of uh, the narrowness of success. Um, in Japan, um, there is quite a lot of pressure at age 15 in ninth grade, but that pressure is, is a bit more delayed. Um, in, there's no primary school leaving exam, so they don't have that level of pressure. But in Singapore, it happens even younger. So in Singapore, you have high stakes exams at age 12. And high stakes is a loaded term, I know. Um, but I mean it. They are high stakes. If you don't get into, if you don't do well in your PSLE or primary school leaving exam, then you don't get into a good secondary school. That limits what courses you're allowed to take. So you do badly in your primary school leaving exam. You can't even take GCSEs. So then it's very difficult. It's not impossible because you can move if you do very, very well, but it's quite unlikely that, that certainly that you'd be, ever be able to take A-levels, which denies you certain opportunities later on. And parents know this. So parents put a lot of pressure on children to do well in these tests, as you would. And there's a lot of private tutoring that goes on to get students ready for those tests. Um, as a result, those tests actually get um, harder and harder um, because children are learning more and more. So this is from... from Mouths of babes. This is a. This is from a blog. Um, oh, what's it called? It's by a lady called Petunia. Sorry, I really ought to quote her properly. But she writes a lot about education, and she's got a son who, in her blog, she calls Little Boy. And this is a recorded conversation between Little Boy and his mum, and they're talking about the exams being difficult. Um, so this is PSLE. So he's twelve. Mum, this happens, since the exams are hard, because as different groups of students go through the education system, children become better and better. Therefore, this forces the government to raise the standards of the PSLE. Mum. Yes, but where will it end? Maybe in 10 years' time, PSLE students will need to do research in order to get into a good secondary school. <coughs> Little boy. That won't happen, Mum. It's just like a bubble, you know. It'll burst one day. Mum. Eh? <laughs> Son. Okay. The government will raise the standards of the PSLE. The PSLE bubble of skills and knowledge will get bigger and bigger and bigger. Then, when the students cannot take it anymore, they will all commit suicide. Then the PSLE bubble of skills and knowledge will pop and become smaller because the government will be forced to bring down standards, otherwise there will be no more children left. <laughs> we will all have died. <laughs> so as long as you help me get through this, it will be OK. We can do it, Mum. And don't worry about your grandson, because I think when that time comes, the bubble will have burst. Mum, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> so little boy is probably, probably be okay because his mum is, is an expert in child psychology and aware of these things and how stress affects children. Many children don't have parents like that. They, they may have parents who understandably put pressure on children because they, it does affect their lives. So you can probably tell from the way I'm saying this that I disapprove of having such high stakes for children at such a young age. And Singapore, of all of the countries that I went to, is the only one that does this um, at, at, at that age. I think Canada strikes a, strikes a good balance in terms of um, external, um, provincial or national assessment. Um, so they, they have a balance. So they have some subjects are examined through provincial level tests, standardized tests. Um, so you might have you know, three in year 10, four in year 11, four in year 12 equivalent. Um, and the other subjects are assessed through teacher given grades um, over the course of the whole course. So for university entrance, that's what they will look at. They will look at that combination. Um, in primary school and in secondary school, what, what the Canadians are doing, and certainly this is the case in Ontario and, and British Columbia, is they have certain standards that they expect all children to reach per year. So for, they will have standards for year eight, they will expect in math, children to be able to do X, Y, and Z. And the way that those children are assessed and that assessment is reported by the teachers um, is 
not yet at expectations, at expectations, fully at expectations or exceeding expectations. Um, the reason that I point that out is because that is different from what we did here until quite recently. So they say, right, this is where we want you to get in year eight. Um, we used to say, okay, you're a level three. You should be a bit higher in than that by now, but you're in level three, so the next step for you is let's try and get you to, you know, a 3A and then a level four. And, you know, that might happen for you in year nine or year 10. It's quite a different approach to saying everyone's going to get here in year eight, and if you're not there, rather than saying, oh, okay, well, maybe next year, they are giving them extra support to get them up there. And I'd like at this point to introduce you to Bart Simpson. So, Bart is actually very wise. Um, so my question for you is, what do Chinese teachers and Bart Simpson have in common? I won't actually get you to answer it. Funny haircuts. Funny haircuts. <laughs> None of the Chinese teachers I saw had hair quite like that. Um, so, so I spoke to two Chinese teachers who had been abroad to teach. Um, one had been to England um, on, the, on the mass exchange program that's happened quite recently. Um, one had been to America and taught there for a year. And so I obviously asked them, so what do you think of the differences, you know, strengths, weaknesses, pros, cons? And they said lots of lovely stuff about both England and America. Um, and it's absolutely true. There was a lot of fantastic practice going on in English schools, and I do want to kind of emphasize that because the very nature of what I talk about means that I sound very negative about England, and there is some wonderful, wonderful practice going on. I think it's just in pockets. Some schools are absolutely phenomenal, others are fairly dire. Um, but I did push them and I said, okay, well, is there anything that you thought was less good um, in these countries? And both of these, these were two different conversations and both of them uh, seemed to be a bit uncomfortable and said the same thing. Um, one thing I found strange though is that some students were given easier work. How are they supposed to keep up with their friends if they do easier work? They were really confused. Bart Simpson says something similar. Um, so there's one episode in which Bart is put in a remedial class. And he says, let me get this straight. We're behind the rest of our class, and we're going to catch up to them by going slower than they are. <laughs> cuckoo. Cuckoo. Um, now, that actually is very logical, isn't it? Um, and it... it I hadn't ever considered this question or thought this way until I went out and spoke to those Chinese teachers. But it does seem strange. If we want students to do well, why would we give them easier work? Um, now, look, bear with me, bear with me, because I'm going to talk a little bit about differentiation now. But first of all, I wanted to share with you the, the kind of macro picture. So five of the six... Uh, sorry, I also went to New Zealand. I shamefully admit New Zealand because I didn't write about New Zealand and New Zealand crashed in Pisa um, well, since, I, since I went there. Um, I can talk about that if anyone's interested in why that is later. I just didn't really think it was fair to put those theories in a book and publish it. Um, <laughs> so all five of six systems I visited, um, students are not tracked into different schools until age 15 or 16. So Singapore being the exception, as I mentioned. Um, and actually, of 12 top performing systems in 2012, 10 of those are not tracking until 15 or 16. The OECD average is 14. So they're all leaving it later to put students into different schools based on ability. Of those countries, they are also not selected into different classes by ability until 15 or 16. So they're not setting or streaming either. Again, coming from England, from a secondary school in England, that was fairly mind-blowing for me because I've only ever taught into, in a school where there were setting for almost all subjects. Um, and even within a classroom, oh, first of all, it shouldn't be that surprising because if you look at the research on setting and streaming, this is taken from the Educational Endowment Foundation Toolkit where they um, look at all the research in an area and summarise its impact. Um, sorry, summarise the impact of the intervention. Setting on streaming, they find that it has negative impact, but it is very cheap. So... Maybe that's why lots of English schools still do it. Um, based on moderate evidence, so the locks indicate how strong that evidence is. Um, even within lessons, there's not 
in these countries, it's not actually that much differentiation by activity. And this is self-report from teachers, tell us again. So England, 63% of teachers are saying, I, I differentiate by giving different activities to different students. Every lesson or most lessons, 63%. Certainly when I was teaching, it was very much encouraged. If you were trying to do like an offset outstanding lesson, you had to have mild, medium, and spicy worksheets. <laughs> um, so it's very much encouraged here. The average internationally is 44%, but Finland, Japan, Singapore, Korea, Netherlands are doing it much less. Um, so that's interesting. Um, so how on earth does that work? Because mixed ability teaching, or correction of myself, mixed attainment teaching, let's not be assuming that ability is necessarily measured by the test that they take at the end of primary. Mixed attainment teaching is really hard. Um, it's difficult. If there's a big gap in terms of where students are at, it's quite difficult to teach. Um, and, but and yet these countries are managing to do it and managing to have far more of their students than we do getting at least those basic levels of literacy and numeracy by the time they leave school. So it's not simple. It's not that they're not differentiating. They are differentiating, but that differentiation is by support rather than activity. So rather than giving them easier work, they might give them like, some extra support, more scaffolding, but the intention is always for them to have ultimately the same outcomes as is stated in the national, the provincial expectations. Um, now, there are a number of ways in which the, the, they make this work. Um, and I think the, the difference here, so we, of course, we talk about high expectations in England all the time. Certainly, when I did my teacher training, it was all about high expectations. But I realized that actually I didn't have high expectations of the students I taught when I was teaching. I had high hopes. I really hoped <laughs> they would all get at least to see. But I didn't truly expect or take the behaviors. You know, I taught as best I could. But the, there's an assumption here that, well, they need, to, they need to meet these standards. So we will design our system so that they meet these standards. We won't hope that they are going to get a C and then put them in the bottom set and say, oh, well, you came in on a level three, so you're only really going to get whatever it is. I've been out of the English classroom in that system for a couple of years now. Um, they, they have those same high expectations. So yes, some children are going to need more support to get there, but the intention is that they will still get there. So here are some things that they do to make that work. <laughs> How do they make that work? So I'm going to talk through a few. Oh, that's not in the right order. So firstly, they have excellent teachers. They have well-trained teachers who plan together to ensure that each concept is taught clearly the first time, um, looking at research often in terms of what is the best way to explain this particular concept, and then explaining it in different ways until all students understand. They employ or make time for additional teacher support for those who still don't understand or fall behind. They design curriculum for mastery, and I'm ru running through these. I'm going to come to each of, each of these in turn in a moment to ensure that all understand before moving on. And crucially, they believe that it's possible. They believe that all children can achieve. So let's start with the first one, so teacher collaboration. I'm, I'm, I won't go talk about teacher training now, but if anyone would like to talk about that, feel free to, to ask during the questions. So once your teachers are in schools, um, in Finland and East Asia, there was at least weekly timetabled planning of lessons for all teachers of a subject um, or in the same year group. Um, that certainly didn't happen for me when I was teaching. Perhaps some schools in England do it. But this is, this is quite a save in terms of workload. Rather than having to plan all, your, all of your lessons, you, you co-plan with other teachers. There's an opportunity to learn from more experienced teachers. And you're not having to plan all the lessons. You might plan a particular activity, and another teacher might make a, a worksheet if that is the approach that they're going to take. Um, they have lesson study, which I touched on earlier. So on a couple of occasions, um, I walked into classrooms in, in Shanghai um, and also Japan. And you'd have 10 teachers at the back of the room with clipboards. Uh, it happened to me because I, I was obviously teaching as well, so I'd have lots of teachers come and watch me. And you've got lots of teachers and possibly a video camera at the back of the room. It seems quite intimidating. But it's not, having spoken to them, it's not intimidating for them in the way that it would be intimidating were this happening in a school in southwest London where I taught. Because they are not judging the teacher, they're judging the lesson. And that's the key difference. So what they're doing when they come, they plan it together for a start. So they're jointly planning this lesson. 
Um, and then they are in the classroom and watching the students. They're writing down what the students say. They're having a look, oh, where did the students get stuck? Where was there a misconception? And then they come back together and they discuss, OK, what can we change about this lesson plan so that the students don't have that misconception next time we teach it? So you can see how you will then have a bank of lessons which have been tried and tested and adapted for teachers to use and adapt as they see fit based on the particular students that they teach. Again, massive reduction in workload for those teachers. Um, and then finally, I mean, different, different ways of doing this in different countries, but all of them had um, professional learning communities of one sort or another. Um, and these kind of steps to an effective professional learning community are taken from a couple of sources. Um, one's called Beyond PD from a, from a group of researchers in New Zealand, and one's from Dylan William. Um, the references are at the bottom there. Um, you can see on, on the right, I'm not going to talk through all of them, but, but three different approaches from three of the countries I went to to professional learning communities. But essentially, they, they are based on an analysis of student learning or an identification of a problem. So what, either what have the students done poorly in a test or what particular problems am I having in the classroom? What do I want to solve? Um, they will often, not always, but include a focus on subject-specific expertise. So this is not just about classroom management. This is about how do we teach gravity? What are the common misconceptions when you're teaching gravity? Um, they're sustained over time, they're collaborative, and they happen approximately every four weeks. Um, Dylan William has found at least 75 minutes with 8 to 12 participants is ideal. Um, there's one, oh, and just one other thing that I wanted to say before I move on is that this kind of professional collaboration is not, is not only helpful in terms of workload and helpful in terms of improving teaching. Um, it's, it's good for teacher well-being. Um, and there was a study done by um, Professor Liana in New York City um, on what she called social capital. Um, and she looked at, um, she asked teachers to fill in a questionnaire saying how, how many times did they talk to their colleagues about um, teaching and what kind of relationship did they have in terms of warmth with those colleagues. And she did find that in those schools that had um, kind of healthy professional learning communities, just in the sense of having good connections with colleagues, the students did significantly better than, than in countries, um, sorry, in schools where they didn't. So social capital really makes a difference and connecting teachers with each other has a whole host of positive benefits. Um, additional support. Um, this is Julius. So Julius is Finnish. Um, and he is a special teacher. So what that means is that in, in Finnish schools, they, you don't only have class teachers, history teachers, um, or, or class, class teachers in primary. You have special teachers who work with those students who are stuck. Think teaching assistant, but with a degree and an additional master's in special needs. Um, they're working as a teaching assistant. Um, and that is the case in Finland and Canada. So they will employ additional teachers to work with students who are falling behind. That's how they can do these mixed attainment classes. Is the, I mean, the teacher themselves does a lot in the first place. And certainly in Finland, some of the teachers were complaining that they can't just get Julius in. They have to kind of write down what they've already tried to bring these students up to keep up with the class. Um, but they, they use them as different groups each time. You know, sometimes it's the same children, but it's not, right, you guys... You're the slow ones. You're going to be in a different room always with this teacher. It's dependent on the subject. It's dependent on the content. They might have misunderstood a particular thing, so they're going to go out. And also, it's not only children who are falling behind. It's those who are actually ahead of the class. It's those who need a bit of stretch, a bit of challenge. Julius will occasionally take those children out as well and do um, extension activities with them. So there's less of a stigma attached. Um, Japan, Shanghai, and Singapore have touched on this already. It's also expert teachers who are supporting those weaker students, but this time it's the class teachers themselves. Because as I said, they're teaching fewer lessons, they have more time, they can, they can do that in between lessons uh, or during um, independent study lessons. So, so in these East Asian countries, in the afternoons, they'll often have a session in school where the students are getting on with independent work, um, which means teachers can come in and, and have a quiet word with any students if they need to on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and then parental or tutor support where necessary. How am I doing for time? Perfect, perfect. Oh, when there's a cheaper version, because this sounds really expensive, doesn't it? Yes. Cheaper version, perhaps slightly less effective, but I think still an excellent idea, is peer tutoring. 
Um, so in Canada, they do this consciously, deliberately. They will take students, older students, so either year six in primary or um, sixth form level in secondary, um, and they can sign up for a peer tutoring program. It counts often for credits. They will have a little bit of training in how do you best support students to learn, and then they will meet with younger students at lunch times or after school and actually support them in their learning. It's free. Um, and, and accidentally, less planned, but this ha also happens within. If you have a mixed attainment class, the way the teachers use it, it can happen within a class. And I would like to introduce you to Ilpo, who is awesome, bit of a character from Finland, who's a um, local district um, policy person. So I was asking, um, oh, I was actually asking Ilpo about um, the hi higher retainers. And this is his, I think, typically Finnish response. He says, the brightest kids, they'll learn anyway. Whatever you do with them, they're not the ones that need the help. Um, I think when you're very talented, I mean, this is realism. There are more talented and less talented people. That's just the way of life. We're different, luckily. When you're more talented, you learn whatever you do. If you stand on your head, that's not a problem. But in the same time, you learn different things when you have to support someone who hasn't got that kind of talent. And if you're in the same group, sooner or later, you're in that situation where you say, well, don't you see? It works like this and this. And then you have a different level of learning inside your head. In that sense, you learn more and differently. And the less talented student also learns, the basic things at least. So anyone that's been a teacher will know that you don't really know something until you've had to explain it to someone else. Thanks for the murmur of support. <laughs> Um, which leads me neatly on to mastery curricula, curricula and approach, because he's talking about the, the weaker students learning the basic things at least, and this is absolutely what the approach is with mastery curricula. So what we will sometimes, slash a lot of the time, do in England, and I know they do in America as well, is there's quite a lot, of, a lot in the, the national curriculum or the school curriculum, and so you right, having to rush through, and certainly I found this, you know, I had a, a moment that made me want to go and see if there are other ways um, where I, was, I taught science. There was quite a chunky science curriculum to get through. I was told when I arrived that they hadn't actually finished the previous module, so I had to do that as well with the year 11s. And so I was just, just doing content, 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 rushing on to the next thing. And I had one student um, who was not that engaged usually, put up his hand and said, Miss, why do we sneeze? Which is completely irrelevant to the topics I was teaching. But I just said, I haven't got time for that. And yeah. it's not in the curriculum. It's not in the exam. And I moved on. And that's such a shame, because wouldn't it be wonderful to have the time and the space? I mean, ideally, slightly more related to what I was teaching. But to, to go into, to answer those questions, to, to not completely go way off topic, but to bring children in by answering those questions, um, and I didn't have time. There was too much to cover. So mastery curricula. So in, in the East Asian countries I visited, they, they teach fewer topics, particularly in the earlier years, um, but it's in greater depth. So they will not move on to the next topic until everyone has understood the current topic. Um, they'll get lots and lots of practice with each thing. So those who get it more quickly can go into more depth. They can actually be applying that learning um, those who, who struggle have the time to really understand it before the whole class moves on. So the vast majority of peoples are progressing through the curriculum at the same pace. If you fully understand something the first time, it means that when you next come back to it, a little recap should be enough because you've understood it the first time, and then you can build on it with the next, with the next topic. Um, I have said that. Brilliant. Um, and in terms of... Um, effectiveness of this in different contexts. There has been some research from John Jerem at the IOE on this, um, and they've looked into where schools in England have been applying this, this Singaporean um, maths, no problem, I think it's called, approach, which is mastery learning, and they have found that, it, that it's more effective than a control group um, who were doing a, a normal mathematics, um, say normal, I really ought to know what the control group was, I apologise, it's shocking of me. Something else, they weren't doing this. Um, and the EEF have, a, have also had a look at it, and they found that it, on average, children make another five months progress um, taking this mastery learning approach. And it's also very cheap. So finally, 
Um, it's this. All of this is important in terms of supporting all children to reach those high goals. But if you don't believe that it's possible for all children to meet those high goals, you can say you can say, sure, I believe that all children can achieve. I've got high expectations. But you're not really going to put in the effort to explain it in a different way if you think fundamentally, you know, it's just not going to work for you. Don't worry about it. Not everyone can be good at maths. Um, it's okay. You know, you're good at football. That's fine. Um, you, you need to believe that it's possible, and the children need to believe that it's possible. And obviously, teachers believing it and children believing it are going to be related based on how the, how the teachers talk. But not only do you need to believe it, you, you need to want to learn as well. You need to think it's actually valuable to learn whatever it is that you're learning. Um, and I was reading a book this morning um, called What Does This Look Like in the Classroom, which I recommend. And I just wrote down a quote from Dylan William because he was talking about feedback. I thought this was quite relevant, and I'm a big fan. Um, he says, ideally, owning feedback would come from the students seeking feedback. The problem in all this is that many teachers are giving their students feedback on things that the students don't really want to get better at or think that they can't get better at, and that's why the feedback is so unwelcome. You know, I, I, I have a growth mindset. Um, I believe that if I put my mind to something, I can achieve it, um, but I still can't speak French. Um, and actually, actually, that's a poor example, because I do actually want to speak French, so there's more to it than wanting it as well. It's also a matter of, of time and, and correct uh, teaching. But, you know, you've you got to want it. So back to the countries that I'm supposed to be talking about. Um, in Confucian culture, so Confucius being um, ancient Chinese philosopher and statesman who's very influential um, in China and Japan and Singapore, um, learning is a virtue, um, and everyone can do it. So... Um, so I was speaking, again, to Roni, remember the, the Chinese guy who lives in Canada with his own F strategy? So I was talking to Roni about this. Um, no, about something, sorry, about something else. I was talking to him about moral education. And I said, what does it mean to be a, um, a good kid in China? What does it mean to be moral? And he said, oh, w working hard for sure. So, so for him, actually part of being a good person is being studious and working hard, because learning is really privileged. Self-perfection is a goal that everyone should be aiming for. Um, and this is conveyed to children through, I mean, they don't, I don't know whether they talk to them about Confucius explicitly, but through stories like this, this chap, Kuang Heng. So this is a story told to me by another Chinese student I met this time in Shanghai. Um, and she was telling me that Kuang Heng's her favorite. He's a famous scholar, very accomplished. When he was a child, he got a bit upset because he wasn't able to study in the evening because his family couldn't afford um, oil for the lamp. Um, so it's a wasted study opportunity. So he made a hole in the wall of his house. So I'm not quite sure about the moral element of that. But he made a, a hole in the wall of his house so to let through light from his richer neighbors so that he could continue studying into the evening. So through these kinds of stories, children are really given the sense that it's a really good thing we're going to you know, be really pleased with you if you work hard. Um, and that's reflected as well in how they use praise. So it is not, oops, not like this. This is a genuine stamp from off the internet. You can buy personalized stamps. Mr. William thinks I'm smart. Um, research, so I'm, I, I'm, I imagine that, that many of you will be familiar with the work of Carol Dweck. And I've deliberately not talked about growth mindset here because it's a massive topic and there are all sorts of nuances. Um, but. One great thing about her research is the, um, what she's done looking at praise and how you praise children and the kind of mindsets that generates. And she has suggested that telling children that they're smart, praising them for outcomes, is not particularly helpful because then they're not incentivized to try difficult things because otherwise they might fail and then it will show that they're not smart. Um, so much better to praise the efforts and the strategies they put in. Um, and that is what they're doing before Carol Dweck existed, that's what they're doing in, in Japan and in Shanghai. Um, they get children to stand, stand up at the end of the week for applause. It's the child who's worked the hardest, not the one that's done the best. So they're really giving that impression that that is really what they want. Um, and just, I suppose, wanted to finish by, by also saying that sometimes, you know, you'll have heard of tiger mothers, no doubt. Uh, sometimes getting children to these high standards means that the children are going to have work when they're not particularly interested in it. Um, and the teachers will say, well, you've got to do it anyway. And actually, what um, famous tiger mother herself says 
um, in Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother, Amy Chua, is that children don't not necessarily going to find something enjoyable to start with, but once they've practiced it and they get good at it, then it starts being fun because they get that attention, they get the praise, they're doing the praise, I just said it was for the effort, but they're putting in the effort, they're, you know, they're enjoying playing the piano, they're enjoying doing the maths because they've got to grips with it. Um, and I just wanted to contrast that with an alternative approach, which I picked up occasionally in Canada. Not, not, I'm not saying all Canadians are like this, but an idea that the most important thing actually is that children just pursue whatever they're interested in. And if they're interested in, in cats, their project should be on cats, not Shakespeare. I'm exaggerating. Um, but I think, I think that the East Asians perhaps have got it right in this respect that we need to expose children to all sorts of things that they might love, that they might be interested in, but they just don't know about yet. Um, so I want to finish with a little picture of, of the alternative. It says, by the fifth year, Jim really regretted following his childhood passion for ice cream. This is not what we want for our children. Um, I, hope, I hope today that I've given you some, some ideas or at least generated some kind of more thinking um, about perhaps what we do want for our children. Right, thank you very much for having me. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, Lucy. I mean, really, again, a, a lovely journey through the journey that you made. Um, I will say a couple of things, a couple of references. If you're interested in suicide rates amongst 16 to 19 year olds, because this just comes up in lecture after lecture. And I had a very esteemed academic say in response to analysis of mastery methods in respect to mathematics, ah, so you want to kill a lot of our young people. Okay, a very esteemed academic by using these approaches in Singapore and Japan, because Japan and Singapore are so concerned about youth suicide. Yeah, the trouble is that um, which countries are above Japan in the suicide tables? I mean, of Colver's research, Cash and Bridges' research, and Vasaman Cheng and Yang's research. Above uh, Japan are USA. Uh, above that is New Zealand is dreadful. Uh, Finland is above that, and Lithuania is second. Okay, so I mean it just blows all, you know, the common discourse which we see in the press. I mean I agree absolutely. The press have to stop perpetuating these stereotypes. They they pick them up. Um, Stigman and Stevenson that you referred to, are, I mean, are brilliant on this. They did a lot of really really detailed lesson observation, and Jim Stigler got really involved in in observing J Japanese stuff. I mean, he, you cited in your book, actually, this whole, the impossible mass problem. Fantastic bit of work. I mean, he just had an idea. He really immersed himself in Japanese educational culture. And, and he gave some um, North American kids an impossible maths problem. And he'd already analyzed the notions of ability which were present amongst the North American kids. There were kids who were good at maths, and there were kids who were bad at maths. That's the, that was the discourse in the young people. So he gave them this impossible maths problem. And um, the, the mean time at which these kids abandoned this, this impossible maths problem, were about seven minutes. Okay, they just, they, and, and when interviewed, they said, well, yes, yeah, this is obviously a problem that I can't do because my ability is not of the, the, uh, sufficiently developed to tackle it. What he found in the Japanese students is that they continued to try to do it even after he told them that it was an impossible problem. <laughs> okay, because they just thought with more effort it could be solved. And more discussion amongst themselves. They did it collaboratively. That was the other thing. The, 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 highly, the slightly unethical and humorous um, coda to it is that they then carried on doing it. And he came back to them months after and they were still trying to do it. <laughs> Way behind with everything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, of course, not so. <laughs> um, and, and, this, and, and that kind of work that, that, that Lucy's referred to on this emphasis in, in effort is not, on this, this conceptualization of effort amongst, amongst youth conceptualizations of their own learning is not trivial at all. It runs unbelievably deeply through both the educational models and runs through the attainment profiles that we see, better equity, better overall attainment, often at a very precocious level compared with many European countries. Okay, give, having given Lucy a bit of a breather, questions to Lucy, please. I'll take, I'll take them one at a time, I think, because we have, we have some time. 
So, Simon, Simon Payton Jones. Um, so, so um, Lucy, you, I, I really like the idea of, uh, as a qualified teacher, then go and sit in a lot of other classrooms, uh, classrooms around the world and, and, and learn from them. That's something that few other teachers in Britain will be able to do. Mm -hmm. If you were a school governor, mm -hmm. as I, maybe you are, and maybe many of the people in this room are, what one or two things would you want your school to do <coughs> differently? I'm, I'm for a typical British school, mm -hmm. which you also know pretty well. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are the, the sort of number, number one and two things? <laughs> Um, Based on all that you've learned. This is what we always get asked. What one thing would you do? Oh, I don't know. Right, <laughs> give me ten. I'm very happy with ten. Yeah. I'm just trying to make it a little bit... Sure. <laughs> you can choose. So I think, I think quite a few of these things are completely achievable at a school level. You yeah. know, a lot of it is, is, especially in England, schools have so much autonomy that you can do tons of this stuff in, in schools, certainly uh, um, as a governor. Um, so a couple of things that, that I've, I've mentioned, but I would... Um, it's perhaps a little bit expensive, but give every teacher a period to, to collaborate and plan with colleagues of the same um, subject or lesson. Mm -hmm. um, I would, depending on, on where the school is and how big the gaps were, suggest that setting was ended or eliminated or made much more fluid. Because, um, of course, the, these countries, the gap doesn't get as big because they're doing all this stuff all the way through. So, you know, by the time you get to year nine in England, the gap can be enormous. Um, I would change the timetabling so that um, rather than teaching six different grades, so when I first, my first year of teaching, I was teaching year seven, year nine, year 10, year 11, year 12, and year 13. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't teaching, I was 80% timetable, so I wasn't teaching that many lessons, but every single one I had to plan from scratch uh, because they were all different and because there, there wasn't a bank of lesson plans. Um, so I would change the timetable so that each teacher specialised in a particular couple of classes, depending on what subject. If it's maths, you can just t two classes um, and teach like all of the year sevens, sorry, two years, all of the year sevens and all the year eights. Become a specialist in that thing. Also reduces workload because you only have to plan a lesson once for all year, year sevens, particularly if you've gone towards a mixed attainment model, which I think you should. Mm -hmm. um, I would train up teaching assistants as a real priority. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessarily financially... Um, achievable to hire additional support teachers, but I would train, I would essentially give teacher training to teaching assistants um, and make sure that they were um, supporting the kids in a way that's getting them to learn more rather than some teaching assistants, this is certainly not all of them, but will effectively wait, wait enough time. If a student waits enough time, they'll just tell them the answer or do the work for them and so discourage a student effort. Um, I'll stop there. Is that enough? That's so, great. Yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. and, and Simon, the, the thing about one thing or two things, I mean, we've recently published on international comparisons and emphasised uh, the importance of, of, of the alignment of all of the factors mm. which yeah. Lucy has actually talked about. So this, yeah. this issue of, 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 you know, what one thing, which is what journalists always ask, mm. or what two things should I do or fund if I'm a politician, the answer is you really have to look at system alignment. And, and, and the reason for this is that we have very good selective systems around the world and we have very good non-selective systems around the world. Mm. And, but but the, those, those systems are characterised, despite their different forms, the high-performing ones are those that possess, in Bill Schmidt's sense, curriculum coherence, alignment across all mm. the factors. And just, if I can, after that, give yeah. just one thing. Just <laughs> one, no, one thing that's on my mind a lot that I think mm. is terrible practice is tar student target grades. Student target grades, I think, are damaging. There's no evidence that they help in any way, and they just reinforce a, f a fixed mindset idea that this is all you're capable of achieving if you try hard, um, but in both the teachers' minds and the students' minds. Mm. So I'd get rid of target grades. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Other, oh, loads of questions. So we'll go there, there, and there. Thanks very much indeed, Jenny. Can you say who you are and where yeah. you're from? Uh, oh. Ben Knight, Cambridge University Press. Um, one thing you haven't mentioned is class size, oh, yeah. uh, and one of the oh, arguments uh, I've heard put forward is that one of the ways that some of these Asian countries create the economic space to train their teachers, provide support, mm -hmm. is by having larger numbers of students. Yeah. Is that something you've observed? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So the, um, East Asian countries in particular do have larger class sizes. Finland is about the same as class sizes as here. Uh, Canada is smaller. Um, but yeah, they prioritise having higher quality, higher paid teachers um, with bigger classes. There's no evidence that smaller class size helps. I mean, of course it doesn't. By itself, you have to actually change your teaching practice. Mm. Um, and often teaching practice doesn't change. It just gets more expensive because there are fewer students in the class. 
Um, and they can, the, the reason they can get away with large class sizes, and I make this point if I'm speaking to um, educators from developing countries where they haven't got the choice to have small class sizes, is that there is a lot you can do with a large class in terms of having this whole, whole class teaching. If, you're, if, you, if, if you know, some of it is leading from the front and getting class discussion and using formative assessment techniques and whiteboards or whatever, you can actually do some very effective teaching with a lot of students in the class. And, and marking-wise, I guess it's a lot, China, in Shanghai, I'm not saying this is a great thing, but I did on at least two occasions catch students marking who just having a lesson off to mark all of their peers' work. Like they were given the mark scheme and they were marking a whole class set so that teachers weren't doing it. In Japan, students are supposed to mark their own homework before they even come back into school. The answers are in the back of the book. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Right, and then there, and then we'll come here. Thank you. Um, so Mark Neeson from Cambridge International, but also a local primary governor in Cambridge as well. So I was looking out for the word culture. Um, I don't think you mentioned it once, actually. I was keeping an ear out for it. Um, I think it's interesting because I think a school does operate in a culture, whether that's a local culture, a national culture, even a school culture itself. Mm -hmm. um, I would probably define it more as cultural expectations of education rather than a broader culture. Um, but also schools are a lens for that. So schools have to represent and, um, the culture they live in. There are different schools and they all have different cultures. Was there a difference on your travels between primary and secondary cultures? Because that's sometimes anecdotally talked about. And how does that affect the learner progression across the system? Because when we talk about the system, it's just a, it's a continuous system. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what was your perception on the way different schools approached um, yeah. in primary and secondary? Yeah, great question. Um, so the, probably the biggest distinction between primary and secondary in terms of cultures was within Japan. Um, so Japanese middle school is kind looks kind of like you would expect Japanese middle school to look like um, in that students are pretty well behaved you know sitting there in the classroom they're listening to the teacher they're doing group work when they're told to do group work um, marching in time no exaggeration um, in primary schools it was quite a shock because it's so noisy uh, and you like one occasion it's on the top floor and looking for a class and then I, I heard them coming, like this loud noise coming around the corner, children like running back to their classroom, followed by the teacher running back to the classroom, you know, what looks like very bad behavior. And a lot of the assistant language teachers I spoke to, English and Americans who were working in primary school said, yeah, it's quite challenging context. The thinking behind that from the Japanese perspective, and I'm not saying this is that I'm advocating this, it's just different, it's really interesting, um, is that they think that children need to learn how to be part of society of their own choosing. So in the early years of school, they spend quite a lot of time on the socialization bit before they start teaching the academic bit. Um, and they will, children learn in groups called Han. So Han is like a group of four children. Um, and the teacher doesn't say, you must sit there, you must do the work. The child can go and wander off and play if they want. But the Japanese believe that they will see the value in other people and socializing. And if everyone else in the class is getting on with this, eventually they'll get bored and they'll come and choose to take part. So the teacher will, will often praise a Hun rather than an individual student or, or criticize a Hun. So they might say, oh, Blue Hun's done really well over here, but Yellow Hun isn't, isn't ready yet because one of their kids is like gone AWOL. And the rest of the kids in that group will be like, hey, come on, come on, we need to, we need to, get, we need to get the praise from the teacher. So the, gradually the, the idea is that the children will choose to become part of that learning community. Um, they then, it's, it's very strict at middle school, so I think it is quite a shock to some children when they then get to middle school. Um, so this is a very different culture there. But, but universally, so that's Japan, which is an interesting case. Across all the countries that are, all the countries? Less so Canada, perhaps. But they start school at a later, a later age than we do here. So even in Canada, Canada's at six, um, Finland at seven, Shanghai at seven, Singapore at six. Um, and in kindergarten and in the first, at least the first few weeks of school, they spend a lot of time getting that culture right. They spend a lot of time understanding the values of the school, practice and the transition. So they don't go straight into, let's learn stuff. So that's how they develop that culture. Okay, thank you. There's a question, question there and then down here. Thank you. And can you say who you are? That'd yeah, be great. So, uh, Russell Whitehead, uh, LT123. Um, why do we sneeze? <laughs> <laughs> Now, this is a sad, a sad answer, I'm afraid. There is such a shortage of science teachers in this country due to, I think, teaching conditions more than pay, that they get people who do not have science degrees to teach science. I'm one of those people. <laughs> I don't know. 
irritation, I think, in the nose. Yeah. That's another reason why I didn't answer the question. <laughs> and here. Thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, Rosemary Frost, I teach in an independent uh, girls' school. Uh, you touched on it at the end, um, which was about culture. And we talk a lot about what we should do in schools and perhaps change. But I do feel, and I wonder what you think, that in the U it's about how much cult uh, education is valued. Mm -hmm. And I do think an issue in the UK is that education really isn't valued very much. Whereas in these other countries, it's clearly valued highly. And yeah. I do think that influences yeah. a lot yeah. of what happens in schools and the attitude of the mm -hmm. students. Uh, and I just wondered what you thought. I agree. Yes. Should, um, should we look at that then, as much as at our schools? Look at that in what sense? Uh, and try and instill in our country uh, uh, an idea that education is valuable. And so, for example, don't close it as soon as you have an election. You know, close a school. It's that sort of... Mm. Uh, and mm. then the attitude of youngsters, yeah. it's why is education important for me? I don't need it. So I OECD think, have analysed parental commitment, haven't they? Yes. Across, across all the participating so, countries. So, 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 I mean, definitely there are differences yeah, yeah, yeah. in that. Yeah. I mean, I think... So, yes, there are, there are small things, I mean things that you can do to, to make it seem that way to children. So, like, just, again, Japan being very different, they have an entrance ceremony to school at every stage of school, and they invite all the local dignitaries who come and make speeches about how exciting it is that these children are starting or these children are graduating. So, small things like that. Um, I think, also, we need to look outside of education because children will think that education is important if they see peers or other people succeeding because of education. And there's a report out recently suggesting that actually social mobility is not so much to do with education um, as to do with access to the labour market. Um, and I'm, forgive me, I can't give the details of the study, but essentially it was saying that even if in a school in a more challenging area from a certain social background, even if you get the grades, doesn't mean you'll actually go on to be particularly successful in your career. Um, so I think, you know, as a society, there are some, some issues which are much harder to address. Yeah. I mean, we, one, one of the key things that, that Lucy and I have been discussing is the issue of, of, of what does curriculum theory now describe? And the answer is that, that elaborated curriculum theory now includes the relationship between the, the home environment and the school, not least in respect of the amount of, of exchange of formal work between the primary school and secondary school and the home. I mean, Jane Mellenby's in the audience and has done a lot of work on the acquisition of complex language by young children. And that, that's strongly influenced by the linguistic exposure within the home. I mean, it can... I mean, David Blunkett, of course, did confront this. And he said, you know, no longer should we use the excuse of, of, of low social economic status to justify low attainment in schools. I mean, it is... It is and I think it was right to say that, albeit crude, um, in many schools in very deprived circumstances ha have systematically tackled that, not, not least by having means of reaching down into the community to help and communicate to the parents what their expectations, what the expectations might be in those families in terms of supporting children in learning and had some very, very positive results. I mean, in, in Portsmouth, for example, in very deprived areas, the aspirations of, of, these, of these parents, often uh, two generations unemployed, escalated enormously when, when the schools began to make clear the kind of expectations that, that they would have in terms of the amount of learning going on in the home. So I don't think it's a council of despair at all. We, tu you didn't mention tutoring, and this is another myth, by the way, that, that, that knocks around, that the explanation of all of the attainment, the high attainment, high equity in Asian, Southeast Asian area, can be explained through high levels of tutoring. Um, and, and, and what, there, is a, 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 there, is a, there is a real problem with this because the, the, the tutoring is of enormous variability in quality. Okay, which would, and it tends to be the best tutoring. And, and in Singapore, the tutors are on billboards, flashing billboards, as you drive down the streets with their names. And they are highly sought after by, by the most wealthy families. Hang on a minute. A form of educational provision, informal, not regulated by the state, where the very good ones are accessed by the wealthiest families. Hang on, that should increase disparities in the education system, not decrease them. But in Singapore, we have high attainment and low spread. Hmm. So tutoring is not the sole explanation for 
a high level of attainment. It may well be a symptom of a high societal commitment to education amongst all families that you purchase it. And in fact, many of the schools say, we're really annoyed about the tutors because they do things which contradict what we're doing in school, which is very confusing for the kids. Yeah. So, it, it, again, we have, I think, you know, curriculum theory, and I'm looking, oh, Martin's left now, but Martin and I were just discussing this in terms of the approach that we take in Cambridge. Curriculum theory expands to accommodate what occurs in the home and, and, and the attitudes and the learning processes there. Right, loads more questions now. So we've got... Um, I've got, the got the microphone. You've got the microphone, good. And then we've got two, one, two, three, there. Uh, Roy Cross, I work for the British Council. I'm also a governor of a local school where we talk all the time about trajectories, flight paths, targets. Mm. I'm going to abuse some privileged information I have, Lucy, which is that earlier in the year, you were in gentle political disagreement with your father about the foreword to the second edition of the book, right? Yes. <laughs> and I don't know how that came out in the wash, but the, the penultimate chapter of the book has five principles of good mm -hmm. education systems. Mm -hmm. And at some point in that chapter, you say, very po-faced, I don't quite know why none of these actually apply to the UK at present. Mm -hmm. I think I remember that correctly, don't I? I wanted to push you a bit on, how did we end up where we are in terms of education, that you can travel around the world and establish five My principles God. of good education <laughs> systems, none of which apply mm. to us? Mm. OK, great question. Um, so one kind of very easy, cheeky answer, which it won't be my only answer, is that I set out to look at what top performing countries were doing that we were not already doing. So great stuff that is happening in England, and it is happening, was not something that I picked up on as being an explanation for why these countries are doing well. Perhaps, you know, um, it's mea culpa, the right expression here, like, perhaps I should have had six or seven. Um, and, and they're just, you know, some things I think are working. I don't think, you know, if you do these five things, this is all you need to do and this is everything and this will make you top of pizza. Um, so, so that aside, I think it's because it, education has been a bit of a political football in England. Um, it has not been, it's partly it's not been based on the evidence that we have, um, partly because around pedagogy, teachers themselves as a community are having big arguments about it, which makes it quite easy for politicians, politicians to say, well, you know, there isn't a kind of clear body of knowledge saying this is how we should teach, because you're arguing about it on Twitter. So this is what we think, we'll push that. Um, partly, I mean, partly the reason I wrote this book is I wanted the, can't quite say the general population, because there'll be a certain type of person that reads this, but more people, more parents, more school governors, more teachers who aren't normally involved in education policy to understand both what's happening in these systems and some of the evidence behind it, so that taking the indirect route, so that Theresa May can't say, we want more grammar schools, um, and that's gonna help with social mobility, despite the fact that all the evidence suggests that grammar schools are not a help for social mobility. Um, if more people know that, she can't get away with that as much. So it's partly my, my own small attempt to try and spread some of this stuff, which we do know, to a wider um, population. I'll stop there. Um, Christopher Reynolds, former secondary school head teacher and chair of governors of a, a special school for autism. I'm thinking about the exam system, the high value exams that we have at 16 and 18 in this country, and the fact that it doesn't matter how good we get, mm. because we use the normative system, we'll get the same number of failures. Um, I just wondered, the countries that you've been looking at, whether the same end product is there mm -hmm. and whether there's a, a, a backwash in this country because of that that mm -hmm. doesn't occur in the other countries. I think this question I'm going to defer to the man on my left because he's an expert okay. on this um, and I could I could guess but I'm not going to be as accurate as Tim. Okay I'll be very brief I mean the uh, this is often raised you know that the, the big problem in our system is A-levels no other country has anything like A-levels the washback effect is appalling um, actually, when you scratch beneath the surface of all, all other high-performing systems, you find things exactly like A-levels. In America, they have the AP, um, so kids, kids actually accessing university now typically will go, uh, go beyond uh, high school and take between three and four AP before they go to university. If you go to Germany, you'll find a very broad curriculum, 
up to 14 subjects, but the examinations only exist in three subjects, three or four subjects, and they're exactly like A-levels. And I could go on and on about this. I mean, in Finland's exactly the same, and so on. But the key thing, the key thing about this, is that in Germany you have the broad curriculum, as well as the, so you, you, many subjects are taught, and then you have these high-stakes examinations. Yeah, your point is about, about uh, the norm, normative uh, approach to awarding, and yet more recently we've moved away from the attempt to introduce criteria reference assessment to uh, actually linking year on, year on year through statistics, so that even if school schools improve, we'll still, still have the same proportion of the various various grades. That that is true, and we're we're trapped in a, a not very good sort of technical situation at the moment, and and we do need to look at that. If you're worried about the spread, you know, the fact that our, our examinations have a long tail of people getting very, very low grades, then, then we are very, very concerned about that. I mean, Simon and I look at the actual scripts that children write when they get an E grade in an, in an A level, and at the things that they write when they previously got a G or now get uh, a 1 in a GCSE. I advise more people to look at those scripts to think that these kids have been through 11 years of compulsory schooling is a national scandal. And when I said we shouldn't be giving grades for that, <laughs> I was, there was a very, very, an outbreak of shouting occurred in the room. Of course we should be continuing to measure the performance of these children. No, it, it, it is a savage indictment of our system that we have that curve and that long tail. And all the international surveys show that. And I'd love to kind of add to that, um, I think part of the, the problem, the reason it's so difficult here is less because of the assessment, more because of the accountability um, and, the, and the consequences of those assessments as a school, at a school level, rather than from, for, the, for the children. Obviously, there are impacts on the children as well, of course. Um, that's, Tim's kind of covered that point. But for the schools, I mean, I think so long as you have a system where if you aren't making above average progress, you, you know, you might get turned into an academy, your head teacher might lose their job. It's, it generates huge amounts of fear um, amongst schools, which means that you then are very narrowly looking for how do we kind of beat this mark scheme or how can we tick all the boxes for Ofsted. I mean, thankfully, uh, our new Ofsted chief inspector has come out to say we need to have a richer curriculum, stop trying to tick the boxes. But the reason for the ticking the boxes is because of the very high stakes nature um, of our accountability system for schools. And that is different to the countries that I went to, where there is, there's definitely still school accountability. It's really important that the, the province or the government has data on how schools are getting on, but so that they know where to target support, rather than so they know who to fire. Um, I think that's a key difference. You know, how do you make schools improve? Is it by trying to get teachers to work hard, which, I mean, we have a massive workload issue. They're already working pretty mm -hmm. hard. Or is it introducing the kind of support, the knowledge, the capacity for them to improve? If they don't know how, working harder isn't going to help. Yeah. And that, that's a key myth about Finland. You know, no, no school national inspection, no national tests, no accountability. Yeah. They do loads of testing in Finnish primary schools. And all of that, the, those data go through to the municipality. And if, if the teacher assessments and the tests show a, de a serious decline over a a period of time, then there is a supportive intervention by the municipality. There's a, loads of accountability, it's just not of the same form that it's we have here. It's just supportive rather than punitive. Yes, exactly. Now there was a hand up over, oh, now there are lots of hands up over there. That's the zone to take the mic. Hi, I'm Rob Lowe from the Relational Schools Foundation. Hi, Lucy. Um, we've been doing a lot of work in Australia in the last year, and one of the things that we found fascinating in Australia is um, that even though that they don't to do very well in the PISA tables I haven't done in the past, um, children from Southeast Asian contexts in the Australian system still do exceptionally well. Actually, if you could take them out as a data population by themselves, they'd actually be right up at the top of the PISA tables. So does that say more about the system, or does it say more about parents? Um, I think it's a bit of both. Um, so partly it's the stuff I was talking about before with regards to the Confucian culture, that attitude to, um, to learning and effort. That, I didn't go into great detail on that, it's a whole talk in itself, but that is partly encouraged by the way that parents respond to children and, and, and failure. Um, Chinese parents are much more likely to point out failure uh, or, or things that children have got wrong uh, in homework, for example, um, but they're also much more likely to get involved in supporting them to improve. 
Um, and I think this partly stems from certainly a belief in effort, but also I will use this term growth mindset if people don't mind me oversimplifying it. This idea that, well, they can improve, they can do better, um, and let me show you how. Um, so I think that's really key. And so absolutely, you know, that, that's cultural. But as Tim was saying right in the introduction, I think that that's the kind of culture that we can learn from um, and that we can introduce in our own schools. Um, you, can, you can talk to parents about growth mindset. Um, you can explain to them you know, how these things, but I don't, I don't know about anyone that's tried to do that or interventions or what the effect size was, but things like that or, and teachers genuinely believing, talking to children in that way, talking about the importance of effort, telling stories about men that bore holes in walls and let through light. You know, I think it's really important that we pick up on some of that. Um, we're not going to get... I don't think England will ever get to the stage where we are performing in PISA as Singapore does, and I think nor would we want to, because the amount of work that, that children have to put in, I think I wouldn't want to send my children there, honestly. Um, I think there's a lot to learn from them. There's a lot of really excellent teaching, um, but... The, the pressure that comes from the cultural aspect and part of the system, as I mentioned earlier, I think is too much. Right, you're going to fight amongst yourselves for the microphone over there. There were at least three hands up. Oh, and Anne, right, OK. Right, we'll, we'll go for about another ten minutes. Anne Sparrowhawk, recently retired from Cambridge Assessment, um, but also a governor at schools in Cottenham. Um, loved your book, really, really interesting. Um, one of the things that has always fascinated me is where you see the role of language in all of this. And you didn't in your book very much talk about what the English component was of the assessments and the learning that the students were doing. And I'd be really interested to know how that, how that fitted into uh, their achievements. So I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Sorry, what do you mean by the English component? Well, some of the tests are in English. Is that not right? English medium teaching. Um, in PISA? I mean, so they, they'll take it in their, in their they, first language. In the, if, if they take all the exams in their first language. So, so Canada, Canada does, so some children take it in, in French in Quebec, they take it in English elsewhere. Right. Um, in Singapore, they take it in English, but they have secondary mother tongue um, lessons, but they take it in English, and then most of their lessons are taught in English. Japan is right. in Japanese, Shanghai it's in Mandarin. So, so for example, in Singapore, I, I'd be really interested to know how the, the English their need to speak English in a context where they wouldn't normally mm. was introduced into school and how that fits into the, the sort of the teacher's experience of teaching. Mm -hmm. I'm very conscious as a, as a, as a monoglot that uh, I would singularly fail in that sort of context. Uh, so how does it work in that, those, sort of, those sort of cultures? Yeah. Uh, I'd be really interested in yeah. that. So I think, I think language and um, teaching in a second language is, is a real challenge for... The, the fairness of PISA, I suppose. I, I've been doing quite a lot of work in Brunei recently um, where um, they have English medium instruction. The children will be entering PISA uh, in the next round um, in English. And they're at a real disadvantage because it's not their first language. They speak Bahasa Malay, which isn't even a written language. So they couldn't take it um, in that language. Um, and I think they're going to do worse than they would do had they entered it in Malay, for example. But it's, for many countries, it's a... I don't know whether I could say sensible or not, but it's a decision to, to educate children in English because it's a language of business, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in Singapore, I think they've been, it's been an English, English medium for such a long time that the teachers all speak fluent English. It's not, it's not really a case of um, it being... So it may be a second language in that their parents might have spoken to them in Mandarin as children, but they've been speaking English in educational context their whole lives. So it's not a, a barrier for most teachers. Um, and for students, well, they start as soon as they start school. It's in English. Um, and then they have the second... I'm not actually very much answering the question. Tim, do you have anything to say on this? I think I'm failing at this one. Um, I, didn't, I didn't see anything particularly special going on in Singapore in terms of teaching English, yeah. but then I, that wasn't a particular focus of mine, so I wasn't actively looking for it. I don't know if you want to say anything Huge about amounts that. of research on, on do you learn more English language by having mixed English language medium, um, nat natural language um, combined. Um, very, very little evidence on whether that actually inhibits your subject learning. The couple of studies that exist suggest that actually it increases uh, differences between groups. So those who have language facility accelerate by virtue of the combined English language, um, natural language 
um, uh, me uh, double medium teaching. Uh, those that actually don't have a certain level of facility in, say, English, fall increasingly behind. Because if you're, use, if you're explaining something like gravity, you'll probably be using linguistic analogies. And if you don't understand the you know, billiard ball, then you won't understand what on earth is going on. Mm. So a so lot, lot that it's great for learning English, the, the most of the evidence on, on, on mixed, mixed medium teaching for subjects is, is that it, it can lead to increased differences mm. between groups. So I think that that's a, so that's another book to to write. I think no. look at yeah. go and look at countries which are but, doing. But many it, many, many, of them. many countries are going now towards towards um, English medium mm. tuition either for all or some of the curriculum at quite an early age. Mm. It's quite a risk actually. Right, a couple of final questions. Oh, oh, Jenny, right at the back. Oh, thanks, Les. Thank you. Um, Karedi Kadnachel, I work at OCR and previous teacher. Um, two things spring to mind, having just started a, the postgrad certificate um, on assessment, educational assessment. You mentioned that, firstly, testing and, and giving grades, which, again, going through teaching feels very harsh, but from the age of 11 and, and key stage 2 levels, they're predicted into GCSEs and GCSEs 4A levels that we're actually almost putting a glass ceiling in for students from a very, very early age and, and setting them up in some ways to, to lose that belief of being able to, to sort of, you know, recognize they can achieve. Um, and also the way we test in the UK is very heavily monitored and scrutinized and coming from an exam board. Any, any school assessment is immediately moderated and, and sort of normalized. Whereas from what I understand from what you said in, in the other systems that actually the, the teacher assessment up to the age of 16 or even 18 is paramount and not necessarily scrutinized by external agencies in the same way as ours. And therefore our or are we at a point where we almost need a reboot of, of the education system as it currently stands to build in some of the principles that you talked about? So absolutely agree on the glass ceiling thing. We, we are putting glass ceilings on students. And, and it's from even before 11. It's from when they first come into school and they're put in the blue group or the green group. you know, And they know what that means. They, they get easier work. They get it. Uh, and they st too often they stay there. I cannot remember the exact figure, but there has been research on this. And if you are in the slower group in primary school, you will be in the lowest set in year 11. Um, so yes, absolutely agree with that. Um, on teacher assessment, so it is still moderated in these countries. So, so in Finland, where it's teacher assessment, which leads to whether or not you get into um, particular sixth forms, it, it's still moderated. So it's moderated certainly within school, but then the district will also organise moderation externally too. Um, and they'll actually take a sample of students um, every year in every subject and then give them a test and then see how the results of that test compare to the teacher given grades. So there is a lot of moderation just so it can make sure it's reliable. The difference is that in, because um, in Finland there are, it's not high stakes accountability for the school, there's, there's not a mixed incentive for the teacher. So here, if you're, if you're yeah, giving a coursework right. grade, you have a strong incentive, because your head teacher has said they all need to do well in their coursework, you have a strong incentive to inflate that grade rather than try and be reliable. Um, so so I, think, I think, again, yeah, the issue is accountability rather than assessment. Okay, final question, I think. Yep. Thank you. Chris Dale, I'm a Director of Teaching and Learning for the Samuel Ward Academy Trust. Just interested in, in focusing um, on a particular aspect of school culture, and that being behaviour and expectations for behaviour. Obviously, there's been quite a lot of stuff in the press in the relative recent past about behaviour in our secondary schools, and that being the, the elephant in the room in terms of limiting pupil progress. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's also a, a movement among some schools to develop a uh, culture of compliance, zero tolerance, that kind of stuff. I'm just interested to get your perceptions about what that looks like, particularly in the secondary phase around the, mm. the systems mm. that you studied. So, so I'm actually, if you don't mind, going to draw on evidence, evidence, experience from America, where I've just been, rather than these countries. So the difficulty with the behaviour is if you go in not on day one, you don't see the norm setting. You don't see that they, you just walk in and they're all lovely and beautifully behaved. Um, 
Having said that, in every single country I went to, I saw some lessons in which the kids were pretty badly behaved. So what that says to me is it's not that just Finnish kids are intrinsically naturally angels, that the, the schools are doing something, and it partly depends on the teacher. So in China, I saw the same group of children behaving beautifully and behaving appallingly in two different lessons because it's two different teachers. So like anywhere, partly it's to do with the teacher and the amount of authority that they managed to establish in their classroom. Um, at a school systems level, though, um, I do think it's about, as I was saying before, the socialisation in the first few weeks of school is really important in terms of explicitly teaching the kind of behaviours that you expect. Um, and when children are new to a school, it's much easier to do that because it's not the case that they're trying to show off in front of, of all their friends because, well, if everyone's doing that because we've got you before you've kind of made those kind of st the, some of the more negative social influences, then we've got you. Um, and I was, in, um, I was in a charter school in New York two days ago. Um, and, and it was quite, quite stunning, actually, in terms of having... I've been to a few, a few public schools where the behaviour wasn't terrible, but, you know, quite loud, quite a lot of off-task, not really looking. And then went into this charter school and saw the difference, where as soon as the kids came in, they were on task. There, there are lots of little tricks. I mean, it's happening in this country in some schools. Um, but teacher, class, class. And the class go, yes, yes. And then immediately they're quiet. And they've just... It's just kind of training right from the beginning of school, making that a priority before you actually even start your maths or your English. Um, so it's probably stuff you all knew already, but yeah, that's, uh, that's all I have to say on that one. Thank you, Lucy. Do you have anything to add, Tim? No, no, I think that's absolutely fine. I want to add something about the book. Um, so as I said, there are some copies. Um, I, I was, I was um, having a conversation with a teacher who was really struggling in her primary school. She was a, a, a newly appointed head, previously just a teacher within the school. And she was talking about some of the issues around, around the huge disparity in maths attainment in this very small primary school. And so I said, oh, you know, we haven't got time to discuss it this evening, but I'll, I'll, I'll copy you a particular chapter from L Lucy's book. I really commend it to you because it'll give you some really good insights. So a week later I said, have you read it? And she said, oh, no, no, I haven't got time. And, and a week after that, I said, have you had time to read that yet? And she said, oh, no, no, I've had to put it on one side because there are so many things to yeah. do. And I went back a month later and said, you really need to read that because you can change this culture mm. amongst your teachers and your kids in relationship to mathematics. And she said, yeah, but I've got so many other things to do. <laughs> so can I say, Lucy, thank you so much for You're giving welcome. us deep insight, not only into what you've written, mm -hmm. but also into so many places in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Keep an eye on the website. Information coming soon. Um, there'll be something from uh, next lecture from Simon Peyton Jones. Indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>